Gary Brown was nearly ripped apart during a deadly chimp attack on a sightseeing trip in West Africa. He turned and started screaming and charged. I didn't know that they get the, up to the strength of seven men. On the west coast of Africa, deep in the Sierra Leone rainforest, a large captive colony of chimpanzees lives peacefully on the 100-acre Takugama Chimpanzee Sanctuary. Bruno, a 200-pound alpha male, is the colony's leader. An alpha male is the, the term used to describe the highest ranking male chimpanzee. <laughs> The alpha male is the chimpanzee who can win a fight with the other males. In the wild, Bruno would rule a territory at least 50 times the size of the Takugama sanctuary. Less than 40 minutes away, Texan telecommunications engineer Gary Brown is enjoying a day off at his hotel. Working here is a dream come true. They're hiring in Africa. Anybody want to go to Africa? And I held my hand up and said, I'll do it. I wanted to work overseas. Yeah, let's do it. This weekend, Gary's decided to head up to the mountains with a colleague, along with his friend Melvin Mama and their driver, Isa. I said, my days off is going to be spent going and seeing Africa, the real Africa. Isa drives them deep in the rainforest towards the Takugama Chimp Sanctuary. <laughs> he had told me for two weeks before about this place, and, and other Americans had said, yeah, you got to go up there and get pictures or something to see. It's the largest chimp refuge in the world. Bruno is the alpha male. He's so big. Yes, yeah, so I'm from Texas. We grow prairie dogs bigger than any eight. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be glad he's behind an electric fence. Yeah. At the Takugama Sanctuary, Bruno keeps a close eye on his keepers. If you're in captivity, you spend a lot of time just watching. And they would see these locks being opened and uh, closed many times a day and be watching very carefully to see how to get out. <laughs> the chimpanzees presumably took a rock and banged it against the lock. The chimps in this part of the world know how to use rocks. Very few other animals do that. Uh, chimpanzees and humans are really the tool-making and tool-using masters. No one knows for sure how it happened, but it's a breakout. Bruno and 30 other chimps escaped their enclosure and head for the sanctuary's perimeter fence and the jungle beyond. This is really the first taste of freedom that this chimpanzee has had. Unaware of the breakout, Gary and his friends continue to the chimp sanctuary. look up in the mountains and you just mesmerize the trees, the size of the trees, the canopy. Bruno rips through the dense jungle. This is his territory now. He was exploring his world, seeing what world outside the sanctuary was like. 
and is probably afraid. Like the other chimps at the sanctuary, Bruno was brought here as an orphan. His mother was killed in the controversial bushmeat trade. In Sierra Leone, like much of the rest of Africa, people eat chimpanzees and other primates for food. They would have seen their mother and probably other members of their community shot and killed when they were young. The chimpanzees would have that experience. They would remember strangers coming. Uh, they would remember the gunfire. And it's probably a, a reasonable assumption on the chimpanzee's part that a strange human being is a dangerous creature. Bruno hears an approaching car. The chimp immediately sizes up the situation. All of a sudden, out of the brush, this big black thing jumped out. First thing I thought was, cool, you know, I'm seeing something in the wild. Windows. Turn the windows up. Slow down, man. Slow down. Jesus. Issa quickly recognizes that the huge chimp is charging. It's time to get out. Issa. He just threw the car in reverse and just took off backwards. But fleeing only makes things worse. He tied up and he was level with the front window. Bruno seems to have disappeared. And all of a sudden, it was just like an explosion. A chimpanzee that's 120 pounds is gonna be mostly bone and muscle with not a lot of fat. So you have a very compact and powerful creature. Fighting for their lives, they somehow managed to shove the furious chimp out the window. Melvin's hand has been bitten to shreds. Right here, all this was gone. If you run, you're showing that you're afraid of him, you're weak, and he'll take advantage of that. Basically, what they're doing is they're doing damage to whatever they can get a hold of and whatever is exposed to them. Not only is Melvin losing a lot of blood, but bacteria from Bruno's saliva could be spreading through his bloodstream. With two-inch fangs and jaw muscles three times denser than in humans, a chimp's bite can be deadly. They need to get to a hospital fast. And we were yelling at him, slow down, he said, find a place to turn around, turn around, we gotta get out of here. Panicking, he misses a vital turnoff. They're lost. Terrified, they hit a dead end. There was a gate that stood probably 10 to 12 feet tall. <laughs> With their savage attacker hot on their trail. I couldn't believe what was happening to us. They only have one option. We stopped. The collision kills the engine. This car isn't going anywhere. We're on a hill. Let's, let's push it, guys. Let's get some start. But Bruno hasn't finished protecting his new territory. 
when they tried to escape, that showed the chimpanzee that they were afraid and vulnerable and may well have triggered a chase response. There it is. It's coming back. In the Sierra Leone rainforest, American Gary Brown and his party have been attacked by an enormous chimp. I was blacked out, knocked out. I don't know whatever, but I lost a little bit of time. I don't remember people getting out of the car. Horrified, he spots Melvin on the ground. Bruno is chewing him apart. The chimp takes Melvin's foot in his mouth and bites down. Gary's adrenaline kicks in. I was angry. Angry and just mad. Instead of running, I just started looking for a weapon. That's when I lost it. I had enough. And everything that came over me, came through me, all of a sudden I had total clarity. When the chimpanzee saw Gary standing his ground, he would have seen an opponent who was not afraid, an opponent who was angry, and an opponent who could really inflict some damage of his own. I had the tree turned up and was ramming him. And he was trying to get up, and I kept ramming him on the ground. It was a very powerful and hurtful blow. And uh, that was absolutely the right thing to do, because it convinced the chimp that if it kept up this attack, it was going to get hurt. Suddenly, Bruno bolts off. The fight was over with him, because he kept his back to me. And what I seen when I ta we attacked each other, eye contact, facial expressions, I was totally gone on him now. Melvin is badly wounded. His foot is completely mangled. He's bleeding to death. And he goes, I'm going to die here. And I told him, I said, no, when you die here, I die here with you. I'm not leaving you. He's my friend, you know. And there's no sign anywhere of their driver. Where's this one? He went to help. We gotta go. We gotta go. I could hear chimpanzees everywhere. We were totally surrounded. We took off, off down the mountain. These chimps never jumped out. They stayed in the jungle. I kept looking ahead. Finally, we made it out. We made it to the road, the main road. More than an hour later, a passing truck picks them up and takes them to a nearby hospital. Later that day, Gary learns that Issa was mauled to death by the other runaway chimps. Doctors are unable to save Melvin's foot and three of his fingers. There ain't five minutes don't go by, I don't see it. I'm gonna have to picture it in my head every day the rest of my life. If you get bit by a snake or a shark or something, it's, it's kind of impersonal and you sort of expect it. But for a chimpanzee, something that is clearly very similar to us in lots of ways, it, it would just seem a lot more personal, I'm sure. I have no misconceptions. I know Bruno could have taken me apart in a heartbeat. He could have taken me, I think, I, he was just off guard. Of the 31 chimpanzees that escaped the sanctuary, 27 were recaptured or returned on their own. Four, including Bruno, 
are still on the loose. Gary Brown's case is not unique. In May 2007, a silverback male gorilla named Boquito escaped from a Rotterdam zoo. Petronella Yvonne the Horde was a regular visitor. She adored Boquito. She visited him four times a week, always smiling and making eye contact. She felt she had a special bond with the 400-pound gorilla. But on May 18, 2007, Boquito somehow escaped. He headed straight for Petronella. To a gorilla, a toothy smile is an act of aggression. And now, it was payback. Boquito dragged her around the zoo, breaking her arm and wrist. Visitors locked themselves in the cafeteria for safety. Boquito broke down the door, sending tables and chairs flying. Eventually, he was shot with a tranquilizer dart. Petronella never fully healed. Apes are by no means the most dangerous animals in captivity. Some would argue that honor belongs to the tiger. It can slay any human in its path with a single bite. Despite their deadly reputation, people still try to contain and control these remarkable creatures. In the 1920s, when touring circuses and wild animal acts were all the rage, Mabel Stark was the Tiger Queen. She would take 18 tigers at a time into the ring, but not even the Tiger Queen could conquer the basic instincts of a hardwired killer. She was attacked 18 times. The worst took place in 1928 at a show in Bangor, Maine. Stalking her from behind, one of her beloved cats lashed out at her left leg, almost severing it above the knee. Smelling blood, a second tiger jumped off his pedestal and pushed Mabel to the ground, mauling her savagely. Although doctors felt she would never survive, Mabel miraculously recovered and was eventually back in the ring with the animals she loved. As Mabel knew all too well, containing tigers is a risky business. Animal lover Jan Gold was also savaged by a captive tiger. When it broke free at a zoo, her lavish fundraising dinner turned into a living nightmare. He just reached up and grabbed my back. He bit into my head, and the next thought was, am I going to survive this? Zoo Boise is one of the most popular attractions in southern Idaho. The stars here are brothers Taiga and Tundra, a newly arrived pair of two-year-old, 600-pound Siberian tigers. Also known as Amor Tigers, they are at the zoo to provide an important gene pool to help ensure the survival of the species. Tigers are highly endangered. There are now more of them living in captivity than in the wild. But keeping one of the world's most deadly hunters behind bars comes with big risks. There have been at least 45 deaths by tigers in captivity of humans over the last 10 years and there have been 115 injuries serious enough to make the media. Tonight, Jan is helping to stage a fundraiser called the Feast for the Beast, a name that will soon prove darkly ironic. This was the largest fundraiser at the zoo. So there was gonna be a silent auction, a live auction, some entertainment. All of this was uh, on the park grounds at the zoo. The money will help build better facilities for the zoo's animals. I believe in doing what I can for the animals. I love animals, it's always been a fascination for me. 
In the wild, taiga and tundra would roam a territory 18 times the size of Manhattan. They are natural-born killers who can never be completely tamed. They can slaughter with a single bite. You can see animals at zoos, for example, that look at children running back and forth in front of the cages. There is an interest in chasing these children. Nearby in the tiger enclosure, taiga and tundra are getting increasingly hungry. In the wild, they would learn to kill and eat large prey, even bears. But on the menu tonight is 10 pounds of raw horse meat and vitamins. While the tiger's meal is being prepared, Jan takes care of last minute details. I had to run some errands and pick some items up for the auction that was gonna take place that evening. And it was just kind of setting things up. Around the zoo, workers are finishing off their chores. One of the tiger cages is accidentally left unlocked, but no one notices. Hello, everyone. Allison, it's wonderful to see you. Are you enjoying yourself? Excellent. Well, the barbecue should almost be ready, and then it'll be over for you. Excellent. Nightfall in the zoo's social event of the year is underway. It's a good turnout. Dinner was kind of buffet style, and then sitting under a tent, and uh, there was a little bit of entertainment, and then we went on to the live auction. In the nearby tiger cage, taiga and tundra are most likely agitated by all the commotion. Unlike the tigers, Jan and the others at the party have already been well fed. And now, it's time to stretch their legs. I got up with some friends and we just decided to walk around. And we saw the manager walk by. Hello, ladies. Hey, how are you doing? You want to feed the boys? Yeah, that'd be great. Well, that meant he was beating the tigers. <laughs> That's be great. I'm just gonna fall ahead. You guys keep going. Yes, yeah, Steve? We weren't the only ones invited. There were other people, too. Mostly board members or and family of the board members or friends. Jan and her guests are excited. They can't wait to see the big cats feed. Here we go. As I walked down the hall, there was three cages on my right. Jan spots something strange. The last cage, the gate was wide open, and we noticed that. And we just kind of, well, obviously, they must know it's open. And we talked about it, thinking, well, maybe they are going to direct the tigers into the first two cages. <laughs> Instead, one of the tigers is now heading towards the third open cage. And face to face with Jan. All of a sudden, there was a tiger in there. Hello, ladies. How are you doing? You want to feed the boys? At a zoo fundraiser in Boise, Idaho, a cage door has accidentally been left open. And now, board member Jan Gold is face to face with Taiga, a 600 pound Siberian tiger on the loose. It probably never had the door open before. It didn't know what to expect, but it moved forward and it could keep moving forward. <laughs> He is 600 pounds. I mean, his head was 
you know, into my hip area. That's how tall he was. The tiger was probably as surprised as Jan Gould was that they were face to face. And it didn't know what to do, but it did know there was an animal in front of it. At that point, my focus was seeing if I could get this gate shut and keep the tiger in there. But that's easier said than done. Tiger's still not sure how to react. He may not have even seen her as prey because he had never had any experience with live prey. She was just a moving object. But something deep inside said, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. He's moving toward me. I mean, that's a force moving toward me. It was like a few conscious, slow steps because he wasn't stopping and it was, he was right there. Desperate, Jan tries to buy herself some time. I held my purse in front of him, trying to get him distracted. The only thing you can do in that situation is try to distract the tiger. And those who survive often survive because the tiger is distracted. People throw stones or sticks. And that's when I realized the people were leaving. I saw a couple people with terrified looks on their faces because he wasn't stopping. The tiger hasn't attacked yet, most likely because Jan's looking it in the eyes. You want to look big. You want to face it. In the wild, tigers prefer to attack their prey from behind without realizing Jan makes a tragic mistake. I was down and it was very surreal. When she turned around, she provided the framework for the tiger to see, aha, this is prey. And it was at that point that 10 million years of evolution kicked in and it tried to be a tiger. I mean, he just reached up and grabbed my back and just brought me down. When the tiger is attacking a wild animal, it will grab it by the neck and try and drag it down and break the animal's neck and crush the trachea until it can't breathe anymore. And then it often drags it off to feed. I can feel his chest over my back. He bit into my head. And the next thought was, am I going to survive this? His powerful four-inch canines can easily puncture Jan's neck vertebrae, forcing them apart, eventually breaking her spinal cord. He had no experience. He didn't know where to bite, but he bit, and he grabbed her head, and he kept on going. All the others can do is look on in horror. I thought he actually bit through and crushed my skull, and it was so loud. And, and then he came to a point and just stopped, and he held me there. He just sort of held me. A police officer hired as security for the event takes aim. You guys, shoot the tiger! Shoot the tiger! Get off the hey, for the veteran cop, it's tricky getting a clean shot. He fires slightly over Tiger's head just to scare him off. Startled, Tiger retreats to his cage and is finally locked up. The bullets was enough to surprise the tiger to move back. It had never experienced something like this. Unfortunately, in the shootout, a bullet has accidentally struck Jan in the hip, shattering the top of her femur. I'm laying on the ground, and I can't, I can't move from the waist down, or I, I can't feel anything. Jan is rushed to the hospital. Her injuries are horrific. They didn't know if I'd walk again. Um, I had so many nerves that were damaged because uh, that bullet, when it hit my bone, it exploded. And so there, I still have lots of shrapnel in there. My hip had to be rebuilt and a lot of nerves were severed. I've lost probably about a third of the nerve and muscle activity in my leg. 
It takes more than two years for Jan to get over the ordeal, and there aren't just the physical scars to deal with. There was a period of time where uh, every time I closed my eyes, it would be, I'd be reliving it under a different scenario. That was one of the things I had to go through and recover from. The reason Jan Gold is alive today is the tiger was too young, too inexperienced, didn't know how to deal a fatal blow. But at the end of the day, a tiger is a tiger, and it will not have lost its tigerness. For the last eight years, Taiga and Tundra have continued to live in Zoo Boise with no further incidents. To avoid conflict, most captive animals are kept away from humans. But what about those bred specifically to attack, like bulls? Every 7th of July, locals and tourists gather in Pamplona, Spain to outrun a pack of angry bulls. It's a controversial event that dates back to the 16th century. As many as 300 participants are injured each year. 14 have been killed since 1910. In 1995, Matthew Tassio fell while trying to avoid a charging bull. Just 22, Tassio became the first American to die on the streets of Pamplona. Even matadors with years of training can never completely control a powerful bull. In 1947, top bullfighter Manuel Rodriguez Sanchez finally met his match. Going in for the kill, Sanchez was savagely gored, his femoral artery slashed by the animal's jagged horns. The man everyone thought could tame the brute force of a bull was pronounced dead hours later. Half a century later, police officer Kenneth Shaw also found out the hard way what it's like to try to stop a 1,400-pound runaway bull. And was on top of me, slamming me into the ground, and I felt the pain go up to my chest. This thing ain't stopping. Just north of Boston, in Lowell, Massachusetts, a controversial event is underway, a bloodless bullfight. In this version of the event, the animals are not killed. Nonetheless, bulls that are used are much more aggressive than regular farm animals. They're wiry, they're fit, they're athletic, they're fast, they're angry. So the, if you like, threshold for aggression is very different. So it's comparing a Labrador with a pit bull. As this enormous 1,400-pounder waits to face the matador, he gets increasingly worked up. When they can find, when they're frightened, they get sometimes mean and, and certainly unpredictable. So stress, fear, is really the big danger signal for the bulls that will get them to do things that in nature they would never do normally. And for this bull, that means busting out of his trailer, one way or another. Nearby, Lowell police officers Maggie Malik and Kenneth Shaw are on duty. Basically, your job was to keep the patrons from not coming from the facility with any type of alcohol or anything like that. Gorgeous, hot, bright, sunny day. We had over 300 cars. We almost had to close the gates because we couldn't fit another car in. Maggie's main concern is that she doesn't have to watch any of the fight. I didn't want to say it because I don't agree with an animal to be antagonized and ridiculed, and I felt this was inhumane. <laughs> 
Their real problem, however, is a few hundred yards away in the bull's trailer. The noise is pushing the animal over the edge. There was a lot of alcohol flowing. There was a lot of banging around and noise and music, and uh, that's pretty nasty cocktail for a bull, really. You have the makings of a, a, a bull that is going to be, if you like, out of his mind with anger. Suddenly, panic rips through the crowd milling around outside. All of a sudden, I see people start to run and start screaming. Kenneth races around the corner and comes face to face with a half-ton nightmare. Somehow, the angry bull is broken loose. Now, all of a sudden, I'm in a situation where I have to deal with that animal that's running rampant. There's no truth in the belief that red specifically is antagonistic to bulls. Movement is the biggest single factor which triggers a bull attack. The bull zeroes in on a target. The gentleman was basically with his back up against the bed of the pickup truck and the bull just kept slamming him into the back end of the pickup truck. The strength of this animal was truly amazing. If Kenneth doesn't do something quick, the man will be crushed to a pulp. The diamond-like tip of the bull's horns can easily gore into soft tissues. I just started to basically make noises, waving my hands, try to, you know, trying to get its attention. And then turn its attention on me. My adrenaline was just, you know, it just all came so quickly. Charging at full speed is a wall of muscle. It was a scary sight. Nearby, Maggie is unaware that a furious monster is gunning for her partner. Everybody's screaming, there's music going on. You can't really hear anything. It charged me, and I jumped on a vehicle that was close. It slammed off that, that vehicle, and then just bounced off. But I knew it could uh, pack a wallop, so I didn't want to get hit with that. There is no protection against an attack by a determined bull, especially a bull of that breeding of that degree of infuriation, of that degree of temper. Finally, Maggie spots her partner. Kenneth has nowhere to go. They can really hit like a battering ram. Nothing is going to stop them, really. And you'll be punctured. It'll go through your rib cage or some other part of your anatomy. <laughs> They basically threw my body from the side onto the hood of the vehicle to, uh, to get away from its wrath. And that made the, the bull mad. Don't frustrate him and don't antagonize him because you always know that he can pull all the shots. It's frustrated. It looks for something else to demolish. It spots Maggie. He came with a run. He came with a snort. I don't know how to play like that. It's like, oh my God, what do I do with this bull? She zigzags, desperately trying to lose him, but he sticks to her like a shadow. They have this real benefit of almost 360 degrees uh, coverage, so it makes them able probably to react more quickly than humans. So if you stand still, the likelihood is that you won't be attacked. Golly, locked in on my eyes. And that put a chill down my spine. They do this burst of heavy breath out from the nostrils. And this is carrying a chemical message. I'm loaded with testosterone. I'm the, really the king 
guy around here, and you take me on at your peril. The bull loses interest in Maggie and rushes off the stadium grounds, still fuming. Trying to escape, he heads downtown. Oh my God. If the bull can't be stopped, hundreds of lives are now at risk. At a bloodless bullfight in Lowell, Massachusetts, a half-ton bull is on a violent rampage. And now, it's police officer Kenneth Shaw's job to take it down before he reaches the busiest part of town. I'm thinking that this animal is, is gonna basically cause a lot of havoc if we don't stop it. I didn't really even know what I was gonna do. I didn't want anybody else to get hurt. His strength and his power and, and whatever is going on with him. We're not taught in the police academy how to handle it. The only way that I'm gonna be able to take it out was if I hit it in the head. But the bullets barely make a dent. So the bullets would have hit into the side of that animal, caused it pain, but didn't ultimately penetrate and, and cause damage to internal organs. All they would have succeeded in doing would be to infuriate the animal. They have very good armor in the form of their thick skin. The raging bull continues towards the crowd. And I was just hoping that it wasn't going to take a left where all the shopping malls were. Kenneth catches a break. The bull runs off the road and right into an empty parking lot. In an ideal situation, they would have just tried to contain or keep it in that parking lot, let it calm down. This is Officer Kenneth Shaw. I need backup. I need backup. The animal is cornered. It panics. And then it spots a familiar foe. The bull would have recognized him as that same individual, no doubt, and it was an unfinished battle. It's now or never for Kenneth. I have to try to take this out. If I don't, someone else is going to get hurt. But again, the bullets have little effect. This thing ain't stopping. So then all of a sudden it turned and started to do an all-out charge right at me. They will charge through a, literally a brick wall. It was basically literally trying to destroy me, it was trying to kill me. You know, it was bulldozing me and bulldozing me into the ground. Every time that I tried to get up and get off the ground, it kind of knew what it was doing. It swing its head and swipe at my feet and knock me back on the ground again. Pressure that they're able to exert, they all their weight on your body, um, you're going to have broken bones and a reshaped face. And the intention is to kill you, is to take you out. All of a sudden, I felt the pain go up to my chest. It was on top of me, basically slamming me into the ground with its head with the horn slamming me constantly at the, in my leg area. The incredibly solid neck and shoulder muscles of the bull don't bend or buckle on impact. It hits like a battering ram. Maggie tries to draw the bull away for the second time. Seeing Kenny's shattered uniform, seeing the blood on his skin, I, at that point, was not sure if he had gorged him in a major organ, and that takes you only seconds to bleed out. The bull is momentarily confused by Maggie's shouts, buying Kenneth just enough time to crawl for cover beside a car. His knee is gorged. It looked like prime rib. And I know that a lot of grout and dirt and soot, it needs a lot of cleaning, a lot of room for infection, tendon repair, maybe fractured bones. Kenneth's in bad shape. Time is ticking. Maggie needs to act now. 
But the bull still wants a piece of Maggie and takes dead aim. So I said, come on, let's bring it on. Let's go get him. And I shot him right between the eyeballs and then on the forehead. Which is actually the location that is used in slaughter, official slaughter of cattle. This time, the shot stuns the half-ton bull. He staggers away to the other end of the lot. Meanwhile, it's not looking good for Kenneth. I looked down and I could see my bones running, running the back of my, my leg. You're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine. The bull is finally put down when police backup arrives at the scene. Kenneth is rushed to the hospital and goes under the knife. I tore out a piece of my, my quadricep. And then I also received basically a laceration to one of my, my testicles. I could bend one knee, but I couldn't bend the other. Two years later, he finally returns to the police force, a hero. I get the Medal of Valor for basically my, my actions that day. Despite the controversy, bloodless bullfights are still held in some states, including Texas and California. Thank you.